first walked the planet, long after dinosaurs had vanished, when the ocean was a world of giants. One absolute predator ruled the seas. The size of a city bus, this creature feasted on whales. Its name, Megalodon, the deadliest shark in the history of the ocean. Scientists learn what they can about this ancient hunter by studying its closest living relatives. Three times the size of a modern white shark, Megalodon could have crushed this cage with one powerful bite. As stealthy as a submarine and seemingly invincible, the fearsome Megatooth patrolled the seas only 25 million years ago. Like many leviathans of history, the world's most formidable shark would eventually vanish forever. A modern white shark cruises off the Farallon Islands. 20 miles out from San Francisco, these rugged shores are a breeding ground for migrating sea lions and elephant seals. But danger lurks beneath the waterline. Their presence is a magnet for ravenous great whites and for scientists eager for a glimpse at new behaviors. Biologist Peter Pyle has been tracking the enigmatic shark for years. The hunting around the islands is so good that he sees many of the same sharks year after year. We see a lot of seals right in the coves in the shallow areas playing around and lounging around. But as soon as they get out to deeper waters, they know they're in a bad area. And at that point, their behavior will change dramatically and they'll really start to group up and porpoise along at a fast rate. Pyle uses an underwater camera to view the scars and markings of individual sharks and chart their return rate. Every time we get out there and see a shark going by, there's a thrill. This thrill used to be kind of fear-based. We've seen as many as 15 sharks coming and going in and out of that area. And they'll be attracted to the boat itself, especially if it's surrounded by slick and blood. And they'll bite the motor and they'll bite the sides sometimes. But they're not interested in us as food items. Does the great white share these primal urges with his distant kin, the giant from another time? I suspect because its form hasn't changed too much that its predatory strategy hasn't changed too much either. And it's probably always been seals and sea lions or some sort of uh, ancient pinnipeds. Everything's three times the size. You've got megalodon up to 60 feet long. You've got baleen whales that are probably three or four times the size of, of seals and sea lions here. And the thought of a megalodon rushing up grabbing a whale the way that white sharks grab seals here, and the amount of blood and the thrashing. Two million years ago, the last of these hunters would go extinct, but their story doesn't end here. The rise of Megalodon is one of many highlights in the 400 million year old evolution of sharks. From the beginning, they dominated Earth's oceans. Today's sharks are still the ocean's apex predators, creatures that inspire awe and tap our deepest fears of what may lurk beneath the surface. The ancient seas laid out an endless banquet. Sharks prospered, evolving into every possible shape and design, and every color in the spectrum. So elusive are these private animals, that much about their habits remains a mystery. Where did they come from? No one really knows. And where do they go? Millions of years ago, this was the heart of shark country. In the Paleozoic era, what is now Montana lay near the equator the first four-legged creatures were making their way onto land. And the sun-scorched rocks that now line this valley contained a vast tropical sea.
No one knew what lay hidden in these monuments of stone. Until 30 years ago, when a young paleontologist named Richard Lund unearthed his first ancient shark and brought it back to life. 320 million years ago, this was all salt water. There were sharks of every conceivable shape and size and color pattern and probably color in this bay. This was the golden age of sharks. The conditions on the shore of the bay were very shallow, hot, muddy, full of algae, and it was also geologically probably a bit unstable. The bottom of the bay was a very fine mud. Every once in a while, this mud would just slide, blanket over anything that was living on the bottom and swimming near the bottom, kill it, and bury it in the same motion, thus guaranteeing just about perfect fossilization. Now, if you go anywhere else in the world and you hunt for sharks, you hunt for shark teeth. You hunt for shark spines, you get scales. You know, there's only the hard parts preserved. Shark skeletons are cartilaginous. The animal dies, it rots, it's kicked around by the waves, is preyed upon by shrimp and crabs, and all you get is the hard parts left. Here, because the fish were killed, buried in the same moment, you get everything. Bear Gulch is a Paleozoic time capsule. Curious, bizarre, and exquisitely detailed. These sharks are survivors from a lost world. Going in to the rock here, part of the tail here. Good. It's very difficult to imagine a flying shark, but we have them. Okay, there's no doubt that they flew. Pelvic, pelvic fins here. Your tail is going. Group away. known as the Enneoterygians have among their features uh, pectoral fins that come off the nape of the neck. Okay, and they extend almost the length of the body. Now, if you take a look through every living fish today that has pectoral fins like that in that position. Every one of them gets out of the water and flies through the air. Their peculiar design may have safeguarded the Enneopterygians. Still, they were vulnerable to attack by larger, more ferocious sharks. Much like tropical fish today, these flying sharks probably traveled in schools a good survival strategy for fish that might have grown only a foot and a half long. Heavily armored creatures with huge eyes, these sharks had denticles, tooth-like structures, on the leading edge of their pectoral fins. When danger threatened, they escaped the jaws of larger predators on their wing-like fins. We had a picture of sharks, but we had no concept of just how wild the evolution of sharks could get. And really the third aspect of what makes the Bear Gulch so special is we have virtually the entire bay preserved. We can spray that With one. years of experience behind like them, these. finding fossil sharks is still a matter of luck for Lund and his crew. No. They search for the missing links in shark evolution, and the relatives of modern sharks, skates and rays. Female. Beautiful. Well, sometimes it happens just that nicely. Oh, Finn is spectacular on her. It's yeah. a 300 million year old female echinochimera, named for the monster of Greek mythology. She's in perfect condition. There is absolutely nothing as magnificent as flitting a rock and seeing something that is, you've never seen the like of before, something that hasn't seen the light of day for 320 million years, and there it is. And it's gorgeous, and it's stunning, and it's just new, and it's a thrill you can't ever duplicate. On this mesa of brittle rim rock, Lund reunites members of an ancient family. Not the streamlined sharks of the modern seas, but fanciful animals with spikes and whirls. Trapped by a landslide, this male and female falcatus died in a fatal embrace. They're two of the rarest fossil sharks in the world, each 
less than a foot long, from the unicorn-like spine sickled over the male's head to the pair's last meal, the shrimp inside their bellies. Every detail is finely etched in limestone. Though her head is crushed, this female Damocles is one of a kind, the first to surface in 30 years of digging. The male Damocles flaunts his own scythe-shaped dorsal spine and a dangling set of sword-like teeth, distinctly male sexual adornments. Both sharks belong to a family known as the Stethacanthids, a group noted for its flashy mating displays. About the size of a modern great white and highly adorned, Stethacanthus was the master predator of the Paleozoic. When it comes to describing paleo sharks, a picture is worth a thousand words. Conjuring up fantastic fish grounded in science is a passion for Alaska artist Ray Troll. His whimsical illustrations are a who's who of odd prehistoric life. My whole fascination with Paleozoic sharks started out with uh, this one rock in the basement of the LA County Museum. I was down there with a paleontologist. We were leaving this one room. He pointed uh, to this rock on the floor and said, check this out. It's blown paleontologists' minds for years. And guess what? My mind was blown too because I looked at it and I just, I, it's vexing. It just obsesses you. It's a big spiral of teeth. And he said these were shark teeth, and I went home uh, to, well, I went back to the hotel room later that night, I drew this guy out, and it's called Helicoprion. And my first idea of it was that it, these teeth could like snap out like some sort of big uh, octopus tentacle or like a, you know, New Year's Eve party favor and just like whip it prey. And turns out that no, that wasn't right at all. So I began to just sketch and sketch and sketch and sketch, and I kept doing these uh, just little sketches and scribbles and Here's a kind of a funny uh, drawing here. It says, engaging in the game of scissors, paper, rock with World II sharks is not advisable under any circumstances. But then uh, after working through this thing, you know, quite a bit, I've been drawing it for about five years now, I came up with this approximation of uh, what the critter probably looked like. Uh, it's an educated guess. I think it had large eyes. It had a uh, this spiral of teeth in its lower jaw that... Uh, uh, were very sharp teeth, and it had another row of teeth uh, in the upper jaw, and it just sliced through prey. And if you look at uh, some of these spirals, they're rather large. Some of them are uh, three and a half feet across, maybe even four feet. So if you do the math on it, you know, that's a very formidable shark. It's a, it's a nasty, big, high-speed shark that I think just decimated its prey and just rah, cut right through them. Helicoprion. I think probably one of the coolest sharks probably of all time. Now, Troll has set his sights on the deep sea mind bogglers that swim in his imagination. In a few days, he'll join Dr. Lund at Bear Gulch with a suitcase full of new drawings. Montana's rugged cattle country seems an unlikely place to study sea life, but it's the mecca of Paleozoic sharks. Lund has moved his crew to a new outcrop, a tower of limestone slabs rising 150 feet off the valley floor. He's made dramatic discoveries here in seasons past and hopes his luck will hold. There's no substitute for just plain going through every scrap of rock. The challenge is to get to the fossils before the elements do. Erosion takes a heavy toll, and finding a major specimen here is rare. If you try to break the rock up into small enough pieces, eventually, so that there's nowhere a fish can hide. When we started this, it was... Ray Troll hopes Lund will be able to coax a few sharks from their ancient tombs. It's fun to take these things, be the first one to, like, flush these animals out. That, to me, is really exciting, to just... Uh, be the first one to kind of see the animal. We'll come in and get that out. When you start getting little bits and pieces of uh, these animals from long ago that look nothing like your concept of what a shark looks like, you want to know more. Well, paleontologists, racing fish of some sort. 
Through Lun's eyes, Troll begins to see why Bear Gulch is so unique. Layer by layer, Lund has quarried some 5,000 sharks from this remote cliffside over the years, many of them brand new to science. Their ghostly images hint at a once vibrant tropical sea. The cochleodonts, or shell-toothed sharks, resemble aquatic rabbits. The winged Squatinactus montanus could almost double for an angel shark, skate, or stingray. Balancia was uniquely shaped, perfect for maneuvering through branching sponges. Interpreted by Troll, it was as striking as a tropical fish. And Lystracanthus does a shark impression of a porcupine. None of these ancient sharks would survive to modern times. Mysteries from the prehistoric seas abound in the vaults of New York's American Museum of Natural History. Hot on the trail of ancient shark fossils, artist Ray Troll pays a visit to Dr. John Maisie, one of the world's foremost authorities on shark evolution. For Troll, the dusty basement promises adventure. From floor to ceiling, fragments of life long extinct cluster like pieces of a giant jigsaw puzzle. Many times you'll find that these scientists are interested in their particular area, and that's pretty much what they want to talk about. But you have to like keep asking, well, what's on that shelf? And can we look in this drawer over here, please? Yeah. It's a partial tooth well from an Edestus. Um, oh, it's the man. type specimen of a species Edestus giganteus. Look at these teeth here. Oh man, this is this is really this is one of my favorites, uh, if not my most favorite right, one. You can, you can I hold it? Don't oh. drop it. Oh, oh, oh. With its cruel serrated teeth, the scissor-tooth shark may have grown 40 feet long, and if it had an eel-like body, as some speculate, it would have been a deep-sea nightmare. I'm truly amazed at some of the diversity that we see and puzzled by it because very often, especially with some of these Paleozoic sharks, we are confronted with animals that really have no evident fossil relatives, let alone any living ones. So very often they are so bizarre, so specialized, so different, that it's hard to know how to classify them. Many of these fossils are quite unshark-like. Dreadful creatures of the deep, the razor-toothed sharks of the ancient seas had rivals. In freshwater, a reptile-like shark held center stage in another evolutionary drama. Its name, Orthocanthus, the terror of Permian swamps. 245 million years ago, the oceans weren't the only waters where danger lay in wait. Fierce new sharks were moving inland. To swim here was to risk becoming prey. From the rivers and lakes of Europe to the bayous of North America, relatives of Orthocanthus flourished for about 200 million years, the super predators of their ecosystems. The last of them disappeared from the fossil record, while Earth's first dinosaurs thundered across the landscape. They were the original creatures of the Black Lagoon. smooth body, Orthocanthus looked more like an eel than a shark. Camouflaged by thick vegetation, it prowled swamp and riverbed. Nothing that swam escaped its hungry gaze. With double fanged teeth and powerful jaws, it dispatched prey in one terrible bite. I guess we can breathe a sigh of relief that these things aren't around anymore. It's much like dinosaurs. They're really neat to, to see in the museums and go watch movies, but you wouldn't really want them around now. Why Orthocanthus went extinct is a mystery, according to Maisie, but may be linked to the rise of other freshwater sharks. The ancestors of modern sharks would appear toward the end of the dinosaur age.
Hunting for ancient sharks isn't a glamorous business, but week after week, this rural Virginia Creek bed bustles with activity. Heading the effort is paleobiologist Brett Kent, an expert on extinct animals. Despite what most people think, most sharks are very small. Something like half of all modern shark species are less than a meter, about a yard in length. So to find those, we have to break open this very tough chunks of sediment. We have to wash it down through a very fine screen. We have to sort through the gravel to find out what's there. It's time consuming, it's no fun, it's messy, it's muddy. You deal with poison ivy, you deal with bugs, you deal with snakes. But it's the only way you can get the answers. The Fisher Branch site is a biologist's dream, a well-preserved ecosystem with creatures that swam and walked and flew. And fill it up again. Now the reason this site is important is that the bone bed itself that we're tracing has a very complete community and there's no contamination from fossils below it or fossils below it. There's virtually no fossils above or below this contact that we're working. And so it gives us the chance to look at an intact community that's not contaminated with species from another horizon, from another age. Oh, yes. Many of the species are extremely rare, and we may have tens of thousands of teeth from the site collected over the years. And some species we have only a few specimens. There are species from the site which are known from only a single tooth. With only a trail of teeth to follow, the secret lives of sharks may forever be a riddle. But solving the riddle is Dr. Mike Gottfried's dream. For years, the paleontologist has been tracking fossil sharks here in the Chesapeake Bay. Suspended in layers of ancient mud that form the Calvert Cliffs are pieces of the puzzle, traces of animals that swam or were washed out to sea. 20-foot crocodiles once hunted on this shoreline. Ancient seabirds soared overhead. But this was also a bountiful feeding ground for the giant ancestors of dolphins, whales, and the predator that loomed over this prehistoric ecosystem. There are a whole range of animals from filter feeding shellfish, fish eating the shellfish, small sharks eating the fish, medium sized sharks eating the small sharks, big sharks eating the medium sized sharks and the dolphins and some of the other marine mammals all interacting in a food triangle with this giant megatooth shark right at the apex, right at the top of that triangle. Though remnants of their prey survive, all that's left of these ancient sharks, relatives of the mako, the tiger, and the great white are their teeth. The question is, what would be a predator on a whale that got up to maybe 25 or approaching 30 feet long? Well, there's an answer to that question. The most spectacular predator that we know of from the marine environment, probably in the history of life on Earth, these gigantic sharks, gigantic shark called Carcharodon megalodon. And this is just one tooth from one of these sharks, just to give you an idea of how immense they were and the teeth can get even bigger than this. This is a pretty good size one, but not as big as they can get. This is a shark about the length of a greyhound bus and weighing the equivalent of probably seven or eight Tyrannosaurus rex dinosaurs. People who think that dinosaurs are the biggest, nastiest predators that we've had on the planet, uh, there's a shark that was even bigger even more spectacular and clearly the most astonishing apex super predator that, that the oceans have known, at least since the end of the age of dinosaurs. SeaWorld in Orlando, Florida is home to one of the world's largest captive shark populations. Hours before dawn, the staff is rousting the residents for their semi-annual ritual, a physical exam. Corralling a reluctant bull shark isn't easy, but blood tests and ultrasound tell researchers about its life cycles. This facility has had enormous success breeding sharks. They want to find out if any are pregnant. Dr. Gordon Hubble is a former wild animal veterinarian 
and one of the country's most influential fossil shark collectors. With many shark species on the decline, he advocates studying captive animals to protect those in the wild. Loners by reputation, sharks adapt well to aquarium life if mixed with compatible species. Understanding how sharks feed and reproduce and whether they ever rest may provide clues to their sketchy past. We find with shark evolution that a shark species exists for at least 10 million years or more, usually. With mammals, it's not that way. A mammal species will last about a million years before it's replaced by something more efficient or more aggressive. So why are we so concerned today? Well, we find that with all this perfect adaption that they have, they have one flaw, and that is they have a very slow reproductive rate. So when a population of sharks is decimated, it doesn't bounce back like the bony fish populations do. It may take generations. In fact, it may never come back. At home, Hubble maintains an encyclopedic collection of modern jaws and fossil shark teeth for sale to museums and other clients. Though they may look different, they worked and were shed like modern teeth. This entire functional row of teeth on the front of a young growing shark will be replaced about every one to two weeks. And the reason is because all these teeth are connected to the gum tissue which forms in the back of the jaw and moves slowly forward just like a continually moving conveyor belt. As it reaches the point of the jaw, the gum tissue dissolves or is reabsorbed and the teeth that are attached to it fall out and the next tooth uh, will pop into place. Now we don't know really how long sharks live, but in 25 years, the average gray shark will produce around 20,000 teeth. And that is the reason why fossil shark teeth are the most commonly collected fossil in the world. With fossils ranging from the tiniest cookie cutter shark to the grandest megatooth, Hubble's home is a personal museum. So complete is his collection that it rivals the treasures of the Smithsonian and American Museum of Natural History combined. They've done some tests on the biting force of some species of sharks, and they found that certain species bite with a force of 42,000 pounds per square inch. As compared to humans, uh, the average adult male bites with a force of about 150 pounds per square inch. So they're, they're quite an awesome creature. But then when you consider Megalodon with his teeth about three times the size of a modern white shark, they certainly were the ultimate predator in the sea, and you can imagine the force that uh, these teeth exert when they bit down. Terrifying to contemplate, these knife-like teeth of an adult great white measure no more than an inch or so. Imagine an ocean cruising monster with teeth larger than a human hand. Twenty million years ago, that could only mean Megalodon, the megatooth shark, a creature so fast, so ferocious, that nothing could challenge it. It was the ultimate killing machine. Haunting in its desolation, this phosphate mine was once a thriving marine habitat. Today, it's a burial ground for Megalodon and other ancient sharks. For paleobiologist Brett Kent, it's a day-long drive from his home to Lee Creek, but well worth the trip. In this seemingly barren landscape, there's treasure waiting, if you know where to look. Yep. Yep. Mines and quarries in general are strange places to collect. I find Lee Creek to be particularly alien. It's like walking into another planet. You have these hills after hills after hills of pale gray sediment, many of them almost solid shell, very few plants. And the first time you take anybody into the, the pit, their first impression is, I really have stepped off onto Mars because this just is not what you expect Earth to look like. This is one of the richest sites I've ever personally collected. It's just unbelievable 
Uh, and if we were sitting on the bottom of the ocean 20 million years ago, we would see sharks up to very large sharks. We would see whales, we would see seals, we would see walruses, we would see crocodiles. Just a phenomenal diversity. And so when we walk out here and collect fossils, what we find is this almost dizzying variety of species. And sitting atop that community was a shark big enough to attack whales like this and leave damage. For example, right here, you can see a nick right there. That's actually a bite mark, or a megalodon tooth, or another very large shark. I can't imagine what else would have been large enough here to do this, but it took a bite right out of the edge of that vertebra. So this is megalodon food, and this area was loaded with it. Kent's studies of this ancient world show that in size, ferocity, and sheer power, no other shark comes close to rivaling megalodon. It's an ancient megalodon tooth, a little worn around the edges, but with all the serrations intact. If you're after a grizzly bear, you have to know what type of habitats grizzly bears live in. So the first thing you have to do is recognize what habitats would megalodon be in. You're not going to find it in shallow water. You can't turn a big shark in shallow water, so you want deep water. Whalebone, 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 You're looking whalebone. for horizons with lots of whalebone because we find bite marks on whalebone. So you first of all find the type of sediment where megalodon would have occurred, and then you get down on your hands and knees and you start looking. Working under a searing noonday sun, Kent makes every minute count, barely stopping to quench his thirst. Within days, this pit will be covered over. Here we go. And the chance to search for megalodon here lost forever. Got a tooth. The grueling work is soon forgotten in the excitement of the hunt and the possibility of finding something new. Uh, looks like all the enamels there. Yeah. yeah. No cracks? No. That's, that's a oh, that's superior a pretty, tooth. pretty, pretty tooth. I personally would never go back in a time machine unless it had the biggest, strongest shark cage imaginable to look at this creature. Gorgeous, gorgeous tooth. We think of a white shark today as being this phenomenal predator, which it is. Make it twice as long, eight times as heavy. It's the biggest conceivable white shark we have today. It's absolutely terrifying. It was probably warm-blooded, probably highly streamlined, and probably very fast. I think if we were sitting on a megalodon's head, we'd see it moving in, and it'd see a pod of whales in the distance. And it would probably fall in behind them and slowly stalk them. As it got reasonably close, it would accelerate very quickly, and the impact would have been like being hit by a truck. The water would almost instantly go red, and it would start biting through bone. A whale would be doomed. It was a very big, very fast, very aggressive shark. Twenty million years ago, these were fertile hunting grounds for megalodon. Rich estuaries flush with seabirds, crocodiles, and marine life. Today, these tidal rivers attract fossil shark hunters. Unlike the Lee Creek mine, where the hunting is easy and safe, searching the cooper can be risky business and somewhat exciting for veteran diver and fossil dealer, Pat McCarthy. Today, he's joined by a friend, John Babiars, a serious collector from Phoenix. Together, they'll brave water infested with snakes and alligators for what lies on the river bottom. A lot of people have asked me to take them in the river, but I'm, I'm very hesitant. I usually don't do it anymore. It's a little too intense for them, and usually they don't have the experience they need to come and dive in a river like this. John, on the other hand, he took to it immediately. I mean, I was amazed. He went right down the anchor line, had no fear at all. But still, the both of us have had some scary days down there over the past couple years. Most of them involve close encounters with the toothy denizens of the Cooper alligators. Yeah, 
They're very protective and they've been known to kind of come out when you're diving and I've had someone in the boat tell me that they were circling my bubbles the whole time when we were down. Anytime now we see a rather large one, I mean nine or ten feet or over that, just laying up in the grass, we just say, hey, let's just go somewhere else for the day. This is kind of crazy. Okay. All right, here we go. Securing a good dive site requires river savvy, as does keeping it a secret. Megalodon teeth are worth a lot of money, but collecting them here isn't for the faint-hearted. It's not for a novice diver. Visibility is very limited, and you've got to use a lot of different gear, really powerful, professional underwater cave light that we use because the water's basically a tannin colored, almost like an iced tea. And at its best, it's like a clear glass of iced tea, and at its worst, it's probably like a, a mud puddle that somebody stepped in on their way out the door. Yep, watch the rope when you go in. We jump off the bow of the boat, grab the anchor line, and we head down the anchor line, make sure the anchor line is set. Of course, you gotta remember visibility most of the time is either zero or a foot, so you can barely see your hand in front of you, even with your light. hit the bottom with your knees and you just kind of you bend over and you're groping with your hands almost crawling you don't fill your vest up and, and hover and swim nicely over everything you let all your air out and you're actually crawling on the bottom you just start to fan a little bit and kind of feel and see if you can feel a point or any serrations and after a while you just get the hang of it and you just put your mind somewhere else and and you just start feeling for these. And if you're in the right spot and you know what you're doing and you cover the right territory, you can come up with uh, a bag full at times, and, and we have. These dangerous dives have paid off handsomely for McCarthy and Babiars. Their megatooth jaws are irrefutable proof of Megalodon's long and terrible reign. Megalodon as a species was around 15 to perhaps 20 million years. So in terms of success, it was a phenomenally successful species. It ruled the seas. Its extinction was not because it was a poorly designed organism. It was adapted to a particular very specialized lifestyle. And when that lifestyle changed because whales disappeared, it simply couldn't evolve fast enough to survive and was gone. And that's the way Probably most species go extinct. The world changes too fast for them to adapt, and it's over. Put the lower jaw in. It's going to come out to where that schnoz is, or? No, not really. What now, ancient sharks really looked like strategy. is a matter of interpretation, but open to dispute, as artist Ray Troll soon discovers. Schnoz is going to go more like this. And so what you're telling me that this isn't this isn't going to work? What I'm telling you, no, it's not going to work. But on the other hand... I'm leaving. I'm out of here. I'm back wait. to Alaska. All right. Oh, yeah, Come there's on. one right. other problem, okay. by the way. Get rid of these. These, ah! these are not there. This hurts. Yeah, they're gill slits. <laughs> uh, no, this is one opercular cover. Soft opercular covering now. Why? Right? What, what's... Because we'll show you reasons, but there is Stay no. tuned for Stay the tuned. next development. So I'm back to the old drawing board. After talking to Dr. Lund last night, I uh, got his, uh, his take and my latest rendition of this vexing World II shark, which I was pretty proud of. I thought I'd finally kind of gotten it. But uh, he and Eileen had some uh, comments, some suggestions, some revisions, and uh, they even loaned me a, an eraser. And so I went back and erased, and uh, I'm doing it again. If this shark ends up being related to this one very eel-like form, then it would look like this. Okay, and we get these whirls that are three feet across. So if the whirl is three feet across and it's an eel-like animal, guess what? It ends up being about 100 feet long. <laughs> That's what's really, really cool. So here we have somebody presenting the 100 foot long World II shark. Oh, 
Just do a little surgery on this rack. Unlike the world tooth, the, the sharks of Bear Gulch were hardly ocean-going behemoths. Outrageous though they appear, they are evolutionary enigmas tucked between leaves of shale. It's going right through the rock, wow. okay? Come on, hey. After years of cracking rock at Bear Gulch, even Lund hasn't seen it all. <laughs> but this is a new and unclassified species. This is probably new. So it's, it's probably new. It's challenges like this that keep him and the others coming back. Well, we've got a big clump of stuff here. Sort of like swimming through muddy water or something. You get a glimpse of something that comes, it snaps into view for a moment, and then it's gone. Just like that in the fossil. The fossil's kind of torqued over and stuff, and there's a fin out of place. And we don't know if that's a, a pelvic fin yet or a dorsal fin. And uh, it's a lot of hunch work at this point until somebody finds yet another one. This may never come to uh, light at all because, uh, you know, that's all we have of it. That's all he's got right now. They may never, ever, ever find another thing that even comes remotely like that. Can you describe an, an entire uh, species of animals just from that? You know, that's, you just don't do that, I guess. We have plenty that we know only the front half of or a few teeth of. A number of them we just have bits of. You keep digging. Every question we solve in the Bear Gulch raises a bunch more questions. At the beginning, it was just a matter of going out and finding a few fossils. Now we have had to redefine sharks. There's no way any human being can finish this in one lifetime, even without raising more questions as you go along. So basically, my heritage to the future is not the gorgeous things. My heritage to the future is all these bits and pieces somebody else is going to have to go out and find the whole animals too. This is how the story goes on. Dazzling as jewels and just as precious, these are all that remain of the king of the ocean, the terrible giant that could have made dinosaurs cower. What was it like in the time when sharks ruled, when evolution knew no bounds? and rainbow-colored sharks flew through the seas. Could we have dreamt them up if they hadn't existed? And will they come again? Over 300 million years, they have left few traces. Mysterious, elusive, and untouchable as ever.